Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar. Uh, my name is Nathan PC and I lead the risk advisory offering uh, at Foot Anstey. A um, bit of housekeeping, if I may, to begin with. Um, slightly unprecedented situation. Most of us probably working from home or not at our usual office, uh, as are your presenters today. So um, hopefully home internet connections will hold up. Um, but just to help smooth it, if we could ask you to keep your microphones on mute and your videos turned off, that would be really helpful. Um, and should you encounter any audio quality issues during the webinar, an alternative option is to keep the presentation on screen but join the audio via phone and dial in details for that are in your joining instructions. Um, if you've got any questions, um, please do submit those via the chat fun function, which is the speech bubble. Um, and those will come through to the presenter and, if, um, and we'll try and get to those at the end of the session. But we will in any event send out follow-up communications which will highlight key points raised in this webinar and address any additional questions from today. So, to business. Um, obviously, I don't need me to tell you that coronavirus has very quickly emerged as the number one risk to um, global uh, activity. Unlike, unlike most risks, which can be foreseen, and carefully planned and managed for, this is very different. It's also different to most unforeseen events, which by often, uh, if we think of natural disasters, tend to be short, sharp and very visible and where the impacts are more certain. Um, with COVID-19, there remain many questions and uncertainties for us all. And um, it's a very fast moving times and uh, we, are very much uh, working with uh, uh, colleagues and clients to help them through this legal and practical advice uh, to minimize the impacts uh, on a range of issues from people to property to finance uh, and, and governance. But today's webinar uh, that uh, you've signed up to will focus on the impact of coronavirus on supply chains and business to business risk. And, and our aim is to help you can to consider what positive steps you might take to mitigate the damage uh, or any damage in the short uh, and longer term. If you would, uh, if you'd like any information about people related issues, uh, we are holding a separate webinar, webinar focusing on these issues on Tuesday, next Tuesday, the 24th at one o'clock. You can register for that on our website, as well as have a look at our other materials and also contact our dedicated COVID-19 response team that's coordinating our advice and response to all issues across, uh, across the spectrum. And that can be contacted direct through the website or through your usual contact. So today we'll focus on the issues for supply chains, disruption to movements of goods and people and barriers to the provision of services, um, acting promptly to assess the risk um, that uh, coronavirus poses to your supply chains and your ability to meet your own obligations cannot of course be understated. What we've done is we've collated uh, some commonly asked questions that we've already been uh, dealing with and we'll address these in the course of the next 50 minutes or so. Um, and so without further ado, I'll introduce you to our subject matter experts, James Glidden and Catherine Hall. James? Nathan and to all of you for dialing in I hope you're keeping well um, you will have seen an abundance of commentary about at the moment some of it good some of it bad um, personally I can highly recommend regular briefings from the big accountancy firms particularly Deloitte and KPMG to give you the macroeconomic view and some hope actually as to where the economy may rebound in the coming months however Catherine and I are dispute lawyers we focus on resolving and averting disputes in line with the commercial needs of our clients. Typically, more often than not, this is not through formal litigation, but negotiation based on the underlying legal principles and risks. Therefore, in this session, we wanted to offer you some positive and practical assistance, which may avoid and limit risks in the mid to longer term when some stability is restored. At the very least, you should feel better informed on the legal issues 
to allow you to cut the chase in your conversations with your professional advisors. We understand that you have taken time out of a very uncertain and critical time for your businesses. And we have a range of organisations joining us. So we have collated a broad range of questions. As Nathan says, if you have follow ups or need assistance on anything, the team is geared up to help wherever they can. And their contact details are on the last slide. Moving to the first question. And this is probably the most common question we've heard, and it's about force majeure. And it's caused many commercial lawyers to rush to pay attention to what is often an overlooked boilerplate clause. I suppose the starting point to make clear is that there is no universally applicable principle of force majeure in English law, but simply Unless there is a force majeure clause drafted into the contract, it cannot come into, come, come into effect to help either party. Of course, there may be other options and legal remedies. And we'll come to a few of those in a moment. But assuming the contract has a force majeure clause, whether it is engaged and crucially the consequences will depend on the circumstances and the proper construction and application the clause. Like any contractual clause, it will need to be read in the context of the entire agreement. Given they are used so infrequently, it would not be surprising if an off-the-shelf clause has been used. However, doing so can present challenges in specific situations, give rise to conflicting provisions within the same agreement, or worse, not provide for a practical consequences, practical consequence if it is engaged. So I would suggest there are four factors to consider before any reliance is placed on a force majeure clause. Firstly, identify the event which is regarded as beyond the party's control. Now, a typical force majeure clause will define the events that are covered and potentially a catch-all provision for similar but unspecified events. In most modern clauses, an epidemic or a pandemic is commonly included as a specified event. Secondly, linking the events to the prevention or the hindrance or the delay causing the breach. There must be a real causal link between the event and the difficulty in compliance. This is likely to need some consideration and particularly evidence gathering now. Thirdly, establishing that there were no reasonable steps that could have been taken to avoid or mitigate the event. This could be the most contentious aspect. If you are relying on a force majeure clause, you must be prepared to show there is a physical or legal impossibility to meet the obligations, not merely difficulty or that it might be unprofitable, even severely, to do so. Likewise, if the other party is relying on the clause, can you point to alternative steps they could take to meet their obligations? Now, the fourth factor is understanding the consequence. Now, this is where the clause should do the heavy lifting. It could provide for the cancellation of the contract, even automatically. It could excuse one party from performance in whole or in part. Or it could provide for a suspension of time for performance. For instance, a well-drafted clause will consider whether the party should simply be allowed to serve a notice of termination or instead require a reasonable endeavours alternative. So with, that all, with all that in mind, it's worth turning back to the question and addressing some specific points. Particularly, what isn't a force majeure clause? Well, insufficient funding is not a force majeure clause. It's not a force majeure event. A rising costs isn't. A failure by a third party causing a knock-on effect, or even a failure by the other party in the contract aren't force majeure events. All of those things are very real issues right now. So for the business in this particular case, it must take very deliberate steps to identify the true cause of the impediment and that there are no reasonable steps that could be taken to meet the obligation. I've touched on this already, but this is particularly important because if you are trying to rely on the force majeure clause, you will have the obligation to prove it 
This means if you were sued for a breach, you would need to establish on the balance of probabilities that what you're asserting is true. Of course, while many cases, most cases, will be resolved in commercial negotiation than, it, than any formal litigation, it can be hard to predict which will head down that route. And it would be much better and help any commercial negotiation right now to be deliberate and document the evidence. Another short point, your current circumstances may allow some contracts to be fulfilled. In that case, you can prefer one contractual obligation over another and still rely on the force majeure clause in that other contract, provided it's done so on a proper and reasonable business basis. So you may consider some contracts critical or more punitive if breached and wish to prioritise those. It is also worth bearing in mind at what stage the force majeure event may end. For example, if a specific country in your supply chain were to terminate their lockdown and lower border controls, as the protection from liability may be time limited. Some of you may be in the process of concluding a contract or agreement right now, seeking to ensure you're adequately, adequately protected in the current climate. Whilst you should seek advice that meets your business need, the answer is not to beef up your force majeure clause that horse is likely to have bolted. A force majeure clause is, is intended to operate to deal with unforeseen circumstances. The law will expect the risk of foreseeable events to be allocated between the parties in their contractual arrangements. Therefore, in relation to your agreements currently in negotiation, focus should be, a, be paid to dealing with the turbulence through contingent payments, variation provisions, timing consequences and termination clauses. Given the forbearance that is currently around, don't leave matters to disputes lawyers like us arguing some way down the track. Open communication is much more preferable and documenting any compromises will be crucial. So what if your contract doesn't include a force majeure clause or you're not satisfied it will, satisfied it will apply? There may be other avenues to consider, and you may have heard a lot about frustration. I'm talking about the legal doctrine. This is a very old area of English law with plenty of interesting and unusual cases abound. However, though, in modern business to business relationships, it will not offer you the certainty you might otherwise hope for. That said, it shouldn't be ignored and faced with limited options we expect it will get a thorough examination in the coming weeks and months. In summary, frustration as a legal concept will apply if, firstly, the underlying event is not the fault of any party to the contract. Secondly, the event or circumstances occurs after the formation of the contract and was not foreseen by the parties. And lastly, it becomes physically or commercially impossible to fulfill the contract or transforms the obligation into a radically different obligation from that initially undertaken. If frustration is held to apply, the contract will automatically come to an end and the parties will no longer be bound to perform their contractual obligations and then will, therefore will avoid liability for breach. However, it doesn't rescind the, the contract and obligations accrued to the date of the frustrating event are still owed. In cases where some money has been paid or is due, or just, inverted commas, just expenses have been incurred prior to the frustrating event, the Law Reform Frustrated Contracts Act of 1943 provides a mechanism for these to be recovered or kept. However, that in itself requires some careful analysis of the precise circumstances and when the frustrating event took place. Finally, on this question, it's worth considering whether your contract contains a change in law provision, as if laws are passed in order to contain the spread of the virus, these laws and these laws prevent you from performing your contractual obligations. You may be entitled to remedies. However, this will depend on the scope of the specific change in law provision in your contract. Now, I spent a little bit more time on that question because it's the one that's coming in most commonly to our, to our colleagues, but um, we'll move on now to next question which Catherine's going to pick up. Thanks so much James. 
So the question I'm looking at involves a scenario where um, suppliers are late in delivering a consignment of essential parts. They've offered an alternative product, but this is more expensive. Does this amount to a breach of contract? And really, there are two separate issues here to think about. The first is whether or not this um, late delivery amounts to a breach. And the second is whether or not the supplier can actually compel or require you to accept this different, more expensive alternative. So let's look at the issue about delay first. And this is actually a really common issue. And the starting point is to identify exactly what the underlying contractual obligation is and what the contract says about the time for deliveries. So some contracts will expressly state that time is of the essence or they'll provide that the time for delivery is a condition of the contract. And where that is the case, even a slight deviation from the agreed time frame can have a potentially significant impact on the party's rights and remedies. And that's because the breach will be repudiatory. Now, I'm sure lots of you are familiar with that terminology, but um, just to go over it again, in legal speak, where a breach is repudiatory, this means that any delay in performing the duty will be grounds for terminating the contract. And in addition to that right to terminate, the aggrieved party can also claim damages in respect of any loss that's been suffered as a result of the breach, of course, subject to any exclusions or limitations that appear in the contract. Now, if time is of the essence, the potential to terminate the contract for breach might be beneficial to you if it's an unprofitable or underperforming contract, if you're concerned that you're otherwise going to be tied in for a very long period of time, or if your business has been trying to, 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 to exit the contract in any event. The flip side though, is that depending on the particular circumstances, by exercising the right to terminate, you may actually exacerbate the supply issues because of course you'll probably need to have an alternative supplier already lined up in the background to ensure you have continuity of supply. Otherwise, you may find, of course, that you're unable to meet your own contractual commitments to your, to your customers. And we'll come back to that in a moment as it ties in with the second element of this question. If time for delivery is not of the essence, then the deadline in your contract is probably not a condition of the contract. And that's even the case for commercial contracts where perhaps surprisingly, there isn't any presumption or rule that time will be of the essence unless the parties have expressly agreed that. So in those circumstances, any delay would still be a breach. But as I said, you'll only be entitled to claim damages in respect of any law suffered, and you won't then have the right to terminate. It's worth flagging, though, that even where time isn't of the essence under the contract, a delay that continues for long enough or occurs frequently enough may become repudiatory, giving you the argument that you are entitled to terminate after all. So, for example, if your counterparty is consistently late in delivering, even if that delay is only minor each time, it's possible at least that you could construct that as amounting to a repudiatory breach, allowing you to terminate if that is what you want to achieve. However, it's not always easy to know when a delay has become repudiatory and terminating the contract in circumstances where it's not black and white can be a pretty risky strategy. If you terminate too soon, you risk repudiating the contract yourself and incurring liability for damages. And of course, that might be a risk that you're willing to take, depending on how much of an imperative it is for you to get out of the contract and how likely you consider it is that the other party will actually come after you for damages. If there is any doubt about whether or not you have the ability to terminate, a good tip is to try to strengthen your position by serving what's often referred to as a notice to make time of the essence. And this notice will set a date by which delivery must be made. And if that date is passed, the delay will be taken to have repudiated the contract and the aggrieved party will have much better grounds then to terminate. Now, as with service of any contractual notices, you do need to look very carefully at how, when and where those notices need to be served. With many businesses shut down right now and employees like us all working from home, um, a practical suggestion might be to engage a trusted process server to ensure that service does properly take place and can't be challenged later on down the line. But taking all that together, I think from my perspective, the headline points really are, firstly, check what your contract says. Is the time obligation stated to be a condition or is time stated to be of the essence? If so, any deviation from that agreed time frame is likely to be a repudiatory breach of contract 
entitling you to terminate and claim damages. If not, you probably don't have the right to terminate and you can only claim damages if and to the extent you've suffered a loss. You can, however, consider serving a notice to strengthen your position on termination. If you do seek to terminate, be wary of falling into the common traps of delay and affirmation. Now, just turning very briefly to the second part of this question, which is about this issue as to whether or not your supplier can require you to accept an alternative and more expensive product. And the bottom line really here is that the supplier is contractually obliged to deliver what it has agreed to under the contract. So again, the starting point is to check very carefully what the precise nature of the obligation is. You then have options in terms of what you do. If you don't want to accept the higher priced product and you want to use this as an opportunity to exit the contract and you're confident that you've got your backup supplier in place, you may be able to contract the situation as a repudiatory breach entitling you to terminate as we've previously been talking about. If you don't want to or can't exit the contract, you might find unfortunately that you're effectively over a bit of a barrel and you've just got to take it on the chin and agree to pay this increased price. In those circumstances, the best way to deal with the situation is to make very clear to your counterparty that you consider this to be a breach, that you consider you have absolutely no option but to accept the alternative goods, and that you're reserving all of your rights in relation to any claims that you might have in respect of that breach. So in effect, what you're really doing is ring fencing the issue. You're maintaining the lines of communication open so you're avoiding derailment of your business due to the dispute. You're moving on so you can continue to operate your business but you're ensuring that you have the right, should you choose to exercise it, to go back and seek a remedy later on in respect of that breach. Now, the key trap that we commonly come across is that you need to be very careful that you don't inadvertently agree to accept or waive the breach and or um, vary permanently the terms of the contract. At worst, this could bind you to the new price for the remainder of the contract and at best, it could give rise to uncertainty as to what terms actually remain in place between the parties. So to avoid that situation arising, you should always use very clear language when you're corresponding with your counterparty about the issue. And as I said, making clear in all communication that you consider this to be a breach and that your rights remain reserved in full. OK, so I'll hand back over to James to have a look at the next question. Thanks, Catherine. So the next question. Another common question that we're hearing at the moment, um, the customer has short term cash flow issues and has asked for more time to make payment. Um, the question is, should I agree to this? Well, the question has at, at least two elements. What should I do about the breach of contract and how should I deal with the debt? Whilst the latter may feel more important, the former also merits attention now and we'll take each in turn. Firstly then, what to do about the breach? Once you have identified the breach, and in this case it's non-payment, before accepting any compromise, assuming it's acceptable in the circumstances, and blood out of a stone is a common phrase in debt recovery. It's important to analyse the terms of the contract and the ongoing exposure to this customer. Why? Well, for some of the reasons that Catherine's just highlighted, and perhaps we'll, we'll focus a bit more on those now, what if your relationship in the current climate needs wholesale reconsideration? For, ex for instance, are the deliverables, whether they're goods or services, time critical, embedded in a longer process, which is no longer needed, or is the customer at risk of insolvency? If so, non-payment in itself is rarely a material breach, but there may be other breaches which would allow termination. But, and I can't stress this enough, a warning, beware of being too quick to terminate. Some of the reasons that Catherine's just highlighted, if you are ready, willing and able to perform your obligations, but do not have another willing customer to satisfy, it may be better that you are better off letting future liabilities accrue, pursuing a claim for damages, rather than letting the other side off the hook. Also, is there a breach on your side that may negate or be set off against the claims you may have? This may need remedying or otherwise waiving as part of any compromise reached. In this case specifically, I'd question whether there was a retention of title clause or a consensual way of retrieving your product. 
and we'll come on to retention of title a bit more late in a later question. Moving on to the second element of the question then, so how to deal with the debt? Well, understandably, focus on cash is the priority for many businesses. And debt recovery is not an easy process at these times and is certainly not quick. By way of example, the absolute fastest you could possibly hope to recover through a litigation route is, this is a bit of a back of a fag packet exercise, about 40 days. That would require judgment in default, engaging a high court enforcement officer to enforce immediately, and assumes the debtor has cash to pay. It dismisses various pre-action protocols, any defense, counterclaim or setter, a set off the debtor may have, however spurious, and assumes the courts are still operational. Accordingly, as credit controllers are well aware, a consensual payment plan is much better, even if it includes a discount or longer term repayment. This is especially the case if the customer is at risk of insolvency. It may be better to get the payment in and risk a clawback later rather than push for a full settlement now. Particularly, what if the counterparty subsequently defaulted on the discounted payment terms? You'd only want to accept a discount if you're sure it was paid in accordance with expectations. Without specifically carved out in a documented manner, you may not be able to do so. So in summary for this question, once you have been very deliberate over your business strategy, the answer nearly always to both of these elements is to document clearly what is intended and expected and therefore avoid accidentally committing to an unintended waiver, forbearance or release. Whilst part payment of a debt alone does not generally uh, discharge the whole liability, the doctrine of accord and satisfaction may critically come into play. Also note the acceptance of compromise or affirming a contract where there has there was a repudiatory breach, as Catherine has previously mentioned, can be done very easily and even accidentally. So pressure might be on to move quickly, but there is always real value being expressed in communications, even over the phone and following up in writing that matters are subject to contract and all your rights are reserved pending doc documenting the accommodation you're reaching. So that's that question and I'll pass back over to Catherine for the next. Thanks James. So the focus of this question is on litigation so if you have to pull the trigger how do you do that and how do you do that in a way which oh sorry I'm, I'm skipping ahead Um, the focus of this question is on um, litigation and if you have to uh, sue your company how you can do that in a way which maximizes your chances of making a recovery. So taking a step back our advice would be to make sure that in the first instance there really is nothing more that you can do to resolve the situation and make some sort of recovery without the need for proceedings even if you have to accept that you might need to take a bit of a haircut. Litigation is sometimes necessary, there's no getting around that, but in these unprecedented times it really is the case that in a scenario like this, frequently there will be no real winners. So do make sure that you've expended absolutely all of the commercial pressure that you have to bear before you go ahead and think about pulling the trigger. If you have given up on that, the next step uh, we recommend is to do your research thoroughly. You need to have a very clear understanding of where your counterparty is, what its financial status is, how much cash and other liquid assets it has and where those assets are located. We strongly recommend that you use a tracing agent to help with this or obtain some sort of pre-sue report so that when it is time to push the button, you're in a position to make an informed choice about whether and how to go ahead. If you find out that your counterparty has valuable assets such as cash in the bank, stock or even property, then this bodes pretty well for enforcing a judgment against it later down the line. However, if the counterparty has financial difficulties or its assets are, for example, already heavily charged to other creditors, then you might consider that, unfortunately, pursuing litigation is going to be a case of throwing good money after bad. But let's say for now that you are ready to press the button, where can you actually issue proceedings when your counterparty is based overseas? 
Unfortunately, you can't just assume that the English court will have jurisdiction, even if for all intents and purposes, the contract has been performed in the UK. First, uh, you need to check the wording of any written contract in place between you and your counterparty, because most of the time this will determine where any proceedings have to be issued. Commercial contracts will usually specify which country's laws to apply and in which country's court any court proceedings must be issued. These governing law and jurisdiction clauses tend to be hidden away towards the end of the contract um, contained within those quite boring but very important boilerplate clauses that no one tends to look at very much. Usually contracts between two parties based in the UK will provide that English law applies and claims should be brought in English courts. However, where one party is overseas, it's also common to find yourself in a situation where a foreign country's law applies to the contract or that a foreign court has jurisdiction over the claim. Now, the contract might give the parties a choice as to where proceedings can be issued, or it might even be silent on this, in which case there are some quite complicated rules that apply to determine what the position is. If you do have a choice as to which jurisdiction to issue a claim in, it's crucial to consider where the counterparty's assets are located. And in fact, I'd go as far as saying that this should play a very large part in informing your choice. The ideal situation, I think, is to try and obtain a judgment in the same jurisdiction as the assets against which you wish to enforce it, because this will usually enable you to move quickly and secure it against those assets. Otherwise, you can end up with a bit of a pirate victory in that the judgment will only be worth the paper it's written on if you're able to enforce it against the debtor's assets and realise your debt. And I think this really, for me, is the crux of the matter, and it's why I tried to emphasise at the start of this question the importance of investing in proper due diligence into the financial status of your counterparty and really ensuring that you've got a true picture of its assets and where they are so that you can target them in the most efficient way. That said, these problems with enforcing a judgment arise most frequently when one of the parties is outside the EU. For now anyway, uh, enforcing English judgments in any EU member state remains a relatively straightforward process. And as to the impact of Brexit, well, happily, EU rules and judgment recognition currently remain in force, at least for the time being. The range of enforcement options available in the English court is a whole other topic on its own. So for now, I just wanted to flag that the main options are to send in the bailiffs, high court enforcement officers, commence winding up liquidation, obtain a charging order over property, or freeze cash in the company's bank account by way of a third party debt order. And whichever enforcement method you choose should really depend on which you have assessed will yield the greatest and quickest returns. Again, these issues should, as far as possible, be considered upfront when you're working out which strategy is best suited to your particular situation. Now I'll hand over again to James, who is going to look at some of these insolvency issues in a bit more detail. Catherine. Yes, so we've had questions on, on these lines coming in, but we expect them to ramp up um, in the coming uh, days, weeks, uh, as we go forward. Um, and it's it stems from that, that point about the usual contact isn't answering the phone, and we're starting to worry. Um, well, many of the early signs of <clears throat> excuse me, financial distress <clears throat> Do not show up on public registers or records. You should be instead looking out for things like late payment, staff changes, and rumours in the industry. The best intelligence your staff will gather is usually in the marketplace by talking to other creditors and suppliers. Naturally, your recovery strategy will depend on whether the company has entered into a formal insolvency process or not. And that leads to the question, how can you tell Obviously, there are various searches you can run, um, and once a company entered, has entered into a formal insolvency process, documents need to be filed at Companies House. And you can look up a company on the online portal at Companies House for free. But there is obviously a lag, and sometimes that can be a, a week or so. Um, so, moving on then to what should you do if you're trying to make a recovery from a company not yet in an insolvency process? The hard reality here is that often the creditor who shouts loudest gets paid. Um, 
if the debt is undisputed, then the most powerful weapon in the arsenal of a creditor is likely to be a statutory demand. This can be done in respect of debts over £750. And a stat demand is a standard form. And once served, the debtor has 21 days to respond. However, one potential issue regarding the current situation of statutory demands is that the that process is re requires that it must be served and left at the company's registered office in order for the 21 day period to commence. If there is a lockdown, this presents practical challenges in physically serving. We have already made provision with our, our trusted process services, process servers for such circumstances. But in any event, service needs to be planned as the time periods are critical. If a debtor does dispute the debt, then the dispute will need to be considered before any further action is taken. The threshold for demonstrating that the debt is disputed is relatively low. And in the current context, things such as force majeure may de be deployed as an effort to demonstrate a dispute. If a, and this is the, the crucial point. If a debt is disputed on genuine and substantial grounds, that's the test, then your only formal recovery route would be to pursue court proceedings. However, if the debtor doesn't respond within 21 days or they don't dispute the debt on that genuine and substantial grounds, then they will be deemed to be insolvent and that will provide the creditor with grounds to present a winding up petition. The consequences of a winding up petition being presented are severe. Banks will detect any winding up petitions issued against their account holders and will freeze a debtor's bank accounts once it gets notice of the position, the petition thus paralyzing the debtor's business. Therefore, and I can't stress this enough, even the threat of issuing a winding up petition is a serious step and should not be done lightly. What about recovery from a company in insolvency, already in an insolvency process? Well, as you'd expect, this is much more serious and potentially terminal. Um, the next steps will, will depend on whether you have any security, for example, a legal charge over their assets or monies in a blocked account. If you do, then you can still take steps to enforce those security rights. And if you have any other forms of security in the broader sense, such as personal guarantees, you can certainly look to enforce these if the debtor is not paying. That personal guarantees issue is probably worthy of a separate discussion in itself, given the current climate. Um, but it's worth flagging that if you're if they're not in an insolvency process already and there are continual de delays in payment you may wish to demand a guarantee now in order to, to, to continue supply or any forbearance um, and we touched upon this earlier if if the creditor has supplied goods and the goods will still have a resale value if recovered then it, you should consider whether there's any retention of title provisions in the contract it may be possible for the creditor to seek recovery of the goods from the de debtor's premises and sell them on. Indeed, if there are already solvency concerns, it would be worth inserting such clauses into the contract now, if possible, and placing some kind of markers or labelling on stock so the creditor can easily identify goods at a later date. Retention of title is an incredibly complex area and advice should be sought. However, it is usually necessary to act promptly and attend the debtor's premises to get your goods back and notify the insolvency practitioner that the debtor is holding your goods and they are subject to retention as type of title as soon as there are concerns. In that scenario, it is also worthwhile notifying the debtor that any right of resale is revoked. Uh, insolvency practitioner can be personally liable in the tort of conversion if they deal with another party's goods. And so a creditor simply notifying them that their goods are subject to retention of title may be effective in preserving those goods. Um, unfortunately, if you haven't got any security or retention of title, then the best option is to write to the IP providing details of the claim and documents in support. If the company enters into administration, as opposed to uh, winding up, it's worth noting that it may continue to trade and if the supply of your goods or services are essential to it, it's possible the administrator may be willing to pay some arrears in order to continue supply. And this is something that you should explore. So I'm conscious that it's, 
140 and we've got a few more questions still to go but I'll pass over to Catherine now who looks at the insolvency issues from the other side of the fence. Thanks James. Um, so as James has just explained we're looking at things from the opposite position here. Um, so your business has just been served with a statutory demand. What do you need to do? Well, this is really the shortest and possibly the most serious question. The headline answer is don't panic, but also don't delay. First of all, uh, you need to work out whether you owe all or some of the money. If you unquestionably do and you cannot pay what you owe, try to seek an accommodation and document this as we discussed earlier and then ask for the demand to be withdrawn. At an early stage, you should also question if it's even worth commercially incurring the cost of disputing the demand, because in some circumstances, ultimately, it might just be cheaper to swallow it and pay. If you do dispute the debt, then it's imperative to tackle the demand Im immediately. Likewise, if you have a set off or counterclaim that could reduce it to below that statutory limit of £750, then again, dispute it immediately and provide details of the counterclaim or set off. If you don't do this within the 21 day period, you risk the creditor proceeding to issue a winding up petition. And as James has already mentioned, once a petition has been issued, it can have really catastrophic consequences, including um, bank accounts being frozen. So it's important not to let the genie out of the bottle. A statutory demand that is served in respect of a dis disputed debt is an abusive process because what the creditor should really be doing is pursuing the disputed debt through the usual court process. The test is whether there is a genuine and substantial dispute and there are many different formulations and authorities on this but in practice if there is even the hint, is, the hint of a genuine dispute the insolvency courts won't want to touch it. Unlike in the case of a statutory demand for individuals there's no formal process set out in statute for a company to apply to set aside a demand. Rather, the process is to apply to court for an injunction, restraining the presentation of a petition, which is the next step in the process. And again, the creditor should do this within 21 days. If you do intend to dispute the debt, we would recommend that you write urgently to the creditor or its solicitors explaining the, the, de the dispute and the grounds and including as many factual issues and evidence as possible. So, for example, pointing out service failures, losses, this has caused the business, etc. Also make clear that issuing the demand in circumstances where the debt is genuinely disputed is an abusive process and that you demand that if the creditor doesn't immediately undertake to withdraw the demand, um, you will apply to court for an injunction restraining the presentation of any petition and seeking the cost of doing so. Now, what's the outcome of that likely to be? Well, in our experience, nine times out of ten, this will be sufficient for the demand to be withdrawn. And this is because, as I mentioned, statutory demands should really only be used for genuine undisputed debts and a creditor should therefore be aware that if it issues a demand, it's doing so at its own risk. If the demand is genuinely disputed, an injunction should be available, even if the creditor doesn't agree to withdraw it. Now, one final point to touch upon here, given the crazy times that we're in at the moment, what happens if a statutory demand has been served on your business? but there's no one physically in the office, so it's been sitting on someone's desk and the 21 day period has already come and gone. What do you do in that circumstance? Well, this is a lot more common than you would think. And ultimately, the same principles apply. If the creditor hasn't yet issued a winding up petition, but if they have, if they have already issued a winding up petition, things do become more complicated and you need to act extremely quickly. For example, you should be demanding that they do not advertise a petition and that they take steps to withdraw it straight away. Now, obviously, it goes without saying that uh, commercial aspects need to be borne in mind. So if the demand is withdrawn, you may still ultimately face a court claim, which you will still ultimately have to deal with. So it's always worth having in the back of your mind whether or not you should move swiftly into settlement negotiations and take a haircut, except that you have to pay something rather than just continuing to fight the claim. All right, thank you. I will pass back to James, who I think is going to look at the last question. Catherine, yes, uh, last question. And I have to confess that this isn't a question that's come in uh, so far, but it's a question that we feel is important to raise um, based on our previous experience. Um, 
I mean, and this is experience um, based on a number of examples where fraud has hit business when it's at its most vulnerable. Um, and there's a few points I want to sort of highlight as a sort of uh, to be aware of, flag the risk and just uh, worth paying some attention to at the moment. So um, your risk from cybercrime doesn't change. However, it may be a good time to remind your staff about the risks of clicking links and authorising payments without appropriate checks. There have already been instances and reports of fraudsters sending emails talking about coronavirus to drive clicks on harmful links. With more people working from home, there may also be a tendency to relax processes. It may, for example, be harder to call your own or other businesses' accounts departments to confirm account details and approve payments. With more senior individuals off-site, there may be a rise in spear phishing or CEO fraud. Estense, and these are emails ostensibly from senior individuals putting pressure on staff to send money urgently or take actions without face-to-face -face or verbal communication, ver verbal confirmation. Um, the message should be the same. Do not send money unless you are 100% sure. In addition, in the coming weeks, due at the end of uh, at the end of March, actually, the confirmation of payee protocols will be coming into force and applied by banks. And this change in process may also drive payment fraud. On a separate note, sad as it is to say, the increased risk from um, work, additional working from home or a skeleton staff may well, the risk may well be from more traditional kinds of fraud by employees and associated parties. For instance, when there is less checking, it may seem easier to potential fraudsters to take action, like adding new lines to invoices, moving money around accounts to hide losses or setting up fake counterparties in order to obtain cash through factoring or invoice discounting. There may also be more economic pressure and stress on individuals, which can drive small changes in behavior, which then, times, then sometimes snowball. If people also, if people are doing more than their usual jobs or alternative jobs, the interrelationship between roles can offer more opportunities for fraud that are not controlled by traditional systems. If, for example, an individual has access to both sales and accounting systems, then fake sales or losses of stock can be hidden more easily. Um, and then finally, self isolation can also remove uh, a number of the common indicators of fraud and things which often lead to frauds being uncovered. Those factors that you see on your, your standard AML and fraud prevention training, such as people unusually working late for no reason, accessing systems which the individual has no reason to access, and intimidation or control of others, those things are, are much harder to observe in this current environment. So what I'd say is now is the time to ensure your policies are followed closely and adjusted to the current working environment. If payment requires author authorization from two individuals before it can be made, make sure that isn't just a policy and your payment systems do not allow payment without two authorizations. Also keep a close eye on intracompany bank accounts. Losses and frauds are commonly hidden by moving money to bad debt accounts or dormant accounts through a number of transactions. The message is, I'm afraid to stay vigilant and perhaps designate team members to ensure that policies are still being followed. Um, whilst this may not seem like an immediate priority, it is also the case that if fraud, a fraud does occur, it may be more difficult to address it with reduced staff and more, uh, more difficulties obtaining assistance from your banks and service providers at this time. So I suppose I didn't want to end on that. Um, rather negative and sombre note, uh, what I wanted to say is in conclusion, um, there are plenty of questions and these are just a sample of the ones we're seeing. Um, many more will develop over the coming days and weeks. And frankly, there are absolutely no stupid questions. It sounds trite, but it's, it's right. No stupid questions right now. Our whole team and the whole firm is geared up to help. Personally, I'm, I'm very happy to jump on a a telecon or a VC at very short notice and offer some perspective and just even if it's just a sounding board. Um, these are, as Nathan highlighted, <clears throat> unprecedented times globally. 
But actually, when you break these things down and take them individually, there are issues that we have dealt with and are familiar to us from times of previous economic turbulence, and we might be able to lend a hand. So I'll leave that slide of our team up there um, for you to note down, and we can we can share these slides after the call. Um, do get in touch with any one of us. Um, register for the employment seminar or the webinar, sorry, on Tuesday if that's of particular interest, and keep an eye on our website hub uh, for more news and 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 webinars coming out in the coming days. Um, I'm conscious of time. It's we're up to the 50 minute mark, which is where we we aim to be. But I didn't know Nathan if you wanted to make any sort of overarching observations and sort of things to bear in mind going forward. I think I would only echo, um, well, first say thank you to you, Catherine. that was very clear and informative. Um, and just emphasize and echo what you said about, uh, it's not just you that's willing to jump on a call, we're, we're all here to help and can do that in a, a variety of ways, individually and collectively. Just as an example that occurred to me, we've just um, put together a, a team for a client call multi-disciplines to brief key individuals ahead of a board meeting. So that's just a short practical um, means of uh, brainstorming some issues for a client before they uh, discuss it in a plenary environment. Um, equally, if you just want to have a chat from uh, your home desk or ask us what do we think about something, feel free, all human contact are uh, gratefully received. Uh, and do keep an eye on our website because um, this is very fast moving. Um, I, I'll note about business uh, assistance from the government and some uh, director's duties implications will change. Um, having gone up last night, it will change, I suspect, today. And there will be further developments that will impact your rights and obligations, potentially including some of the points uh, James and Catherine covered off today. So uh, I'll add my thanks to James's for you joining. Keep your questions coming and I hope you and yours stay well in the meantime. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. For Tansty, powering your ambition.